Good hello. evening, everyone. Oh, hello, Dom. Nice to hear from you. I'm in. I'm in. <clears throat> Sorry for the delay, everyone. Sorry. There he is. So welcome. Hi. This is our this is our first melodics event. We're going to be talking about music production <laughs> with Mr. Operate here, who is also called Dom. So hello, Dom. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? We were supposed to be joined by our resident vibes man, Stephen, but he's got food poisoning, I believe. So he's gone. Yes, he does. So we're going to try and keep the chat going. We'll be talking about music production, about <clears throat> careers in music, how to get into that. And we're going to be listening to some of the tracks from the community as well and giving some feedback. Do you want to introduce yourself, Dom? Yeah, sure. So my name is Dom, a.k.a. Operate. Um, I guess I've been doing this moniker of Operate for 10 years officially, but I've been producing for much longer. Um, so I guess it's 14, 14, 15 years now. Um, but yeah, only really took off and I considered doing it professionally in the last 10 years or so. Um, I've been working with a lot of prestigious drum and bass labels um, over the last 10 years. Um, but I still have a lot of love and passion with other genres of music and produce them as well. Um, so yeah, kind of like a whole mixed bag really, but I'm excited to hear everyone's tracks and stuff. Okay, excellent. Um, a little bit about me. I was, I've been producing music for, um, wow, 20 years now. Um, I released music as triple X, Y. I've done some big remixes on labels i remix new order i remix clean bandit um now i'm working melodic and i'm excited to to get people into producing music into discovering their own journey of music basically so am i allowed to say i'm a big fan of yours you can i'm a big fan of yours as well you got some big tracks on uh you forgot to mention the fact magazine which i think people will be very interested to know well, yeah, we can share a link to that in um, <laughs> in the Discord. I I did the first, what is it called? Um, Against the Clock. That's right. So you make a track in 10 minutes. I did the first one of those for Fact Magazine. So that was a long time ago, but it was, yeah. That's a claim to fame if I've ever heard one. Well, thank you. I used to watch Against the Clock when I was at school. So that's, that's pretty big. <clears throat> you are aging me a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> so i just want to get into some just some general questions about production with you i think i can answer them as well and we can um yeah we can just go through i've got a couple of things here so why did you start producing music what was your inspiration you know okay so um i've always been a massive music person my whole life um it's your camera right there. <laughs> yeah, it just fell down, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I can't remember at what point in my childhood, but music was a massive thing for me. Um, and it was just kind of all consuming. And that was just me being a listener of music, you know. I used to have to listen to music to go to sleep as a child. And, um, you know, when you get a bit older and you'll get, you get into school and you, you develop a bit of personality and individuality, you know, you split off from your parents and you discover music for yourself. So music was a really massive thing for me as like a hobby, a personality trait, like whatever you want to call it. Um, so then obviously that meant I wanted to be involved in it in my like life as much as possible. So I did get into um, learning to play instruments and stuff. So I started with a guitar. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Guitar Hero 3. Um, that was a big a big avenue in me getting to realise that it is achievable to do these things. Because, you know, if you learn to play Through the Fire and the Flames by Dragon Force on Guitar Hero 3, you can you can do anything. Um, <laughs> Guitar Hero is like yeah. the original, original melodics, but, but for guitar, yeah, right? Yeah, 100%. And I think, it, I know people say like, oh my God, you know, I can't believe that's how you started. But for me, it was. It was a really nice... Uh, sort of transition into learning guitar for real obviously guitar for real was a lot harder um so yeah basically got into playing guitar i was a massive metal head i loved like emo stuff heavy metal deathcore like everything really um and then kind of as i got older you meet friends who are into music and then it becomes a massive bubble for you however 
the next step for me was like to make music maybe a job or a passion or something that could get me some money and where i'm from was a small town like creating a band was a very difficult thing to do and obviously right. being in a band is a very very difficult industry and it requires a lot of moving parts and yes that was my initial dream uh i i basically with like some i mean we'll probably get into this later in the conversation but my music style changed as well over time like my preferences and basically electronic music became a lot more like prominent in my um listening stuff and yeah so production was my ability to get my teeth into the game as it were but you don't you don't almost you don't need anyone else to be a music producer it can be a very solo thing to do you don't rely on anyone you don't need a drummer you don't need to find a great vocalist because that was the main problem in my band is we couldn't have a couldn't find a singer and like that's like what a core cool element right so yeah production for me is my way of like getting into this industry that i love so much but being able to do it independently i guess that's my one what about yours well, I, I started out in bands. I was playing guitar and writing songs and I was playing through school. We had like a lot of school friends we were in a band with, but there was, I would say, creative differences. So I think, I think basically <laughs> I, just, I just took over and I was making all the music and writing all the songs and leading the direction. So the obvious, obvious step for me was to not be in a band and just do everything myself. And obviously my, my interest in music, my with interest in electronic music grew as I got older and I didn't really want to play guitar anymore and sing songs. So I just learned how to make songs on my own. Like, did you have, I was like, you know, reading internet forums and trying to pick up little bits of knowledge from here and there. Um, did you have people around you that you could learn music production from or were you just on your own? Um, so interestingly, I during this transitionary phase, I made the choice of going to like a music, a music college, or uh, it's just like a normal college, but I did like a music, uh, B tech. So like, mm. it's a national diploma basically. Right. And they just gave us access to, uh, the studios where they had for me, my first love of logic pro nine, I think it was at the time. And we literally would have days at this college where the, the lecturer would be like, right, you just go and crack on and just make stuff. So, yeah, with that, you know, you're kind of like messing about all the time. But I had my friends alongside me who are in the same, like, you know, at the same level. So we're all like learning together. We're mm -hmm. making mistakes together. We're just doing stupid, making stupid stuff, like having a great time doing it. And for me, that was a really great, like, you know, like diving board into getting into it for real. Because for me, when you learn something new, it like, has to be fun. Otherwise, you don't want to do it anymore. And if you like bog down and getting like the perfect output straight at the beginning, I think you're going to like pigeonhole yourself. So yeah, I basically just had me and my friends. I didn't have anyone that like really knew what they were doing apart from um, my close friend who did hip hop and mm -hmm. he was making tunes, I think two years prior. So he was kind of helping me with like arrangement style of things. Mm -hmm. But I very early on wanted to just make drum and bass. Um, so like he couldn't help me as much with that. But in terms of like getting from A to B and navigating the DAW, which was logic for us, uh, he was a great help in that. So yeah, that was mine. But you had you had, people to, you had people to learn together with, right? That was like that was yeah. the core, core element of making music for was having peers you could bounce ideas off and having fun, just being silly, making tunes that make no sense whatsoever, right? And just playing them to each other and be like, look at this weird thing that I've just made. Like it was yeah, it was a massive vibe, man. Awesome. Well, I was I was fully on my own. Like I had friends that like dabbled, but they didn't. They weren't. Oh like, no way! They weren't into into it, into it, into it. They had, they had lots of DJ friends, lots of people that did little bits on NPCs. But they, you know, they make they made beats, but like they weren't. They didn't know about making full tracks and everything. So I was fully on my own. And then I was like making tunes and giving them to my DJ friends. And like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And then like. Some of them had like internet radio shows. Remember those like back in the day? Yeah, yeah. So they would like play some of the tracks on their internet radio shows. And I got some interest from labels through that. You know, my production was, it was not like amazing. It was just, I think I was more like the vibes were, were good, you know? 
people yeah, enjoy yeah, the yeah. vibes of my music and saw something in there and wanted to release it. Like, when did you start sending music out to, out to labels? Did you know people with labels or? I honestly was doing it straight away, <laughs> which right. I really regret now because my tunes were terrible. Um, and obviously the some, you know, were getting kicked back or whatever, but I actually did have a release locked in within the first six months of my journey. Wow. And um, it was this... It depends on the industry. So obviously, you know, I think there's a much higher threshold with certain styles of music, to, you know, to get recognised and stuff like that. Whereas drum and bass is very, like, grassroots, it's homegrown. Um, people love, like, an underdog who's just coming up sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I had I had an opportunity. I, I sent some tracks in and they got signed. And, um, yeah, they came out and they were... Looking back now, obviously not my greatest work, um, but this was, you know, wow, uh, quick maths, 12-ish years ago, um, and luckily they've all been deleted off the face of the earth, <laughs> but yeah, so there is, there is a true, there's like a nugget of like information that where it's like, just sit on your music for a bit until you probably think it is time. I think I was just too excited to get it out even if I wasn't sure on the quality, but I was just really excited. Um, but the methods of doing it was basically just spamming everyone on the internet who ran a label with my music until someone like replied to my message. And I was doing it via SoundCloud, SoundCloud at the time. Right. And SoundCloud was obviously really important, I would say, 10 years ago. Um, whereas nowadays, there's a lot of emphasis on streaming sites and Spotify. Um, but SoundCloud was how I even grew my whole initial fan base. Like we used to, me and my friends who, you know, we all came up together. Like we called it the SoundCloud days, like the SoundCloud grind where you would post like a one minute clip um, on, on your profile. And then you'd have loads of people like jumping and coming in on it. Like, oh, this is so cool. And some of those tunes would just never, ever come out. <laughs> yeah. But like you were still just like nurturing an audience, which is kind of, yeah. That was I the whole vibe, basically. That was where mine was. Mine was a bit like 2010, 2009, 2010. I just upload the stuff that sounds out. Come back at the end of work and see like how many plays it got. And then something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something had gone like completely crazy. I'd like take it off and then find the find the find the label for it, basically. So it was, yeah. So some of them are just like, oh, okay, this is really popular. I should probably find someone to release this. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, not 100%. Did. So that's how I found my early labels. I wasn't even kind of aiming at the people in, you know. Did you, a... did you ever used to have to, like, go to events and sell yourself? No, I'm not very good at that. So I don't and I was always, like, I didn't have great self-esteem. It didn't really work so well when I'm playing the festival stage in front of thousands of people. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, what am I doing? I'm doing this. So I didn't feel comfortable selling myself to people. Saying, oh, this is my music. Do I listen to this? It's more like, okay, you've heard my music on SoundCloud or I said it's a demo. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, I hear that, man. I hear that. And then I got comfortable with like a couple of labels that you know doing so well. It's like one is Rinse, part of um, you know Winter Fem, and Prince FM, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So it was, yeah, that and there was 10,000 yen that people do such record, you know, every 12 months or so on that label. So just keep the, keep the flow going, didn't have to find no bits anymore. Um, yeah, we've got, actually got a question from the community here, which one is yet, that says, aside from like, you know, knowledge itself is not enough to be a music producer. And I'm a beginner, but like, what should I do to continue my learning as I'm to become a music producer? What would be your advice? Um, there's a lot of, I would say, there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube that you can, you can take in. Find someone who, go, who uses your DAW and goes at a speed that you find good, and then just follow the tutorials and learn the insides and outs of your workstation if it's ableton live learn how to use it really well so you're comfortable you know when you have an idea you don't have to think so hard about how you do it you're just trying to like dive in and go for it yeah 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 
Um, I I agree with you there. Getting to know your DAW is like the key bit there because I it, yeah, it's just how you get from A to B. And I think the key thing, because obviously he says um, uh, at the bottom, I don't have any music related degree. So I just want to like make note that I did go to this college where I did a music thing, but. I honestly didn't learn much from the lecturer. What they gave us was time and freedom. And that was me experimenting and messing around. And like we, like I said earlier, we were making the stupidest stuff you've ever heard. But whilst making that, I was learning how to, you know, uh, combine different plugins together or to learn arrangement and stuff like that. So honestly, like I... Educate. You don't need some sort of like education foundation to be a good producer or anything like that. It is all just experience. Um, but yeah, I, well, like you said, there's so much, so many resources now online that I didn't personally have, and I'm sure that you didn't either. And mm. it's crazy because, like, say I am really into a certain artist who's quite prominent and got a lot of you know stuff all over the internet. I could literally type in on YouTube how to make this person bass and most of the time there will be someone who has <laughs> uploaded a video and they'll be like yo this is my interpretation of this guy's bass and like yeah you might sort of be familiar with the synth that they use or you might not be at all but they'll walk you from a to z how to make this sound and then all you have to do is take it and you know you could reverse engineer it or turn it into something that's a bit more you like yeah so i would say youtube youtube university is your best friend a hundred percent okay can we just is my mic sounding any better now is it still sounding a bit your mic sounds a lot clearer now yeah okay sorry just had some some audio issues there i don't know what happened i have to there's this weird mac thing with discord where it makes the audio all choppy and i have to run another app and for some reason they stopped working anyway <laughs> so we are going to run on to some community questions because we had a bunch in the, the events channel that people are asking. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to go for... Uh, okay. So there's one from Yak, so we'll start with this one. It says, not a specific question, but they'd appreciate any general knowledge, feedback, or tips about audio effects, mixing, and mastering. Okay. Um... I'm going to go first because I feel like you have a much larger wealth of knowledge than me. So I would say audio effects, mixing and mastering. Okay, I, so... I, I, can, I can give one and then you do one, okay? Sure, sure, sure. Don't use too much reverb when you first start. It's a mistake I see a lot of people use. They, they just swamp things in reverb and it makes everything quite muddy and... Totally. Kind of like, yeah, so you go with another one. That's a really good point because when you first start making tunes, you think everything doesn't sound like commercial or professional. And oftentimes reverb does. So that's why people really abuse it because it makes stuff sound not like dry and boring. Um, one thing I'll say is like, I know this might not be what, uh, what you mean, but never get bogged down in the mix down during the creation process. Make sure you're just having fun and you're getting your whole tune like skeletoned out and you've got like a start and a finish before worrying about, you know, way or snare would sit in the mix. For me, I often used to get in my own way and then I'd kind of like be sick of the track when I've only got to like 32 bars of length. So I'll just try and have fun, make the tune, vibe out and then worry about the polishing details later. Back to you. Another one I would say is learn to cut frequencies with eq so you'll make a really nice sound on a synthesizer or you'll get a nice drum sound but if you listen carefully sometimes there'll be frequencies that really like stand out and they just don't sound nice at all and you just got to find like when to cut where they are and you've got to cut them out just so these can like build up and create resonances in your mix to sound a bit awful like they, they just kind of like add up and make it muddy and yeah there's a trick where you can like solo the frequency of an equalizer and you can bring it up high and you can hear where these horrible I was frequencies just are. about to sell that yeah 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 so then when you hear that horrible resonant frequency you then pull that down the other way and just take it out because sometimes you'll create this amazing like pad sound you'll be sounding like vangelis 
but it'll just have this like big swampy like frequency in it that you just have to like get rid of. Yeah, hundred percent. Is there anything else um, you on that one? I'm just thinking about mixing. Um, I guess one interesting thing is depending on how complicated your tune is, and like if you've got a lot of track layers and stuff. If you think about stereo spacing, so your you know your stereo imaging, sorry, and where things are placed in the mix, and for those that might not know what I mean, it's kind of it's similar to panning, but if you close your eyes and you're watching a band, you can visualize you know you've got a guitar to the right, a guitar to the left, you've got a vocalist in the center, and then you've got the drum set behind you. So often, if your mix is feeling a bit muddy or crowded. And the like, if you've not got cr uh, clashing frequencies and you're wondering why does this sound so crowded, often you can pan things around in the mix so that they're not like grouped together. So apart from obviously your kick drum and bass needing to be mono, you can pretty much move or maybe your vocal channel as well. You can move everything else around. So like I often will have my uh, like high end like hi-hats and shuffles, uh, tambourines and stuff, kind of panned left and right and set back. Mm -hmm. And then my kick drum will be front and center. My bass will be front and center. I will have maybe like a second layer of vocals uh, like fully spreaded with like a high, a big reverb layer underneath the main central vocal. So there's like right. little things like that where you can just space out your mix if it sounds crowded. Okay, we're going to move on to Saga Music's question. He was asking about mastering and what, what do you put on the end? What, what do you use at the end of the mix to kind of master and level it off? I know I used to just, I used to just mix and then send it to a mastering engineer, right? I would just <laughs> mix it as best I could, right? And then send it to a yeah. mastering engineer. I wouldn't worry about it, but now I, I have to do, for melodics, I have to do more like mixing <laughs> and mastering myself. Um, so do, what did like, you do to get tunes club ready? I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh, I would just slam it through the Sonox limiter and just let just as long as it sounded all right to me. And then sometimes I put it play it in a club and it would just sound awful. And I'd just have to pull pull it out pretty quickly, <laughs> right? I didn't have all yeah. the AI tools that we have available today to kind of like check the spectral balance and the loudness and everything like that. So I also had a friend that was a mastering engineer, which helped. That's very helpful. I, yeah. Mastering is a abyss of secret knowledge that I still don't understand. I am the same as you where I send tunes to my label and I'll send pre-masters and then they get mastered. My home master process is literally slam a limiter on there and a compressor. Mm -hmm. done. I'm done. But obviously the drum and bass scene is a lot more about how hard the tune sounds. So like slamming it against the wall isn't that atrocious. Um, but obviously when it comes to like listening at home, then that's when it's really not great. Um, but yeah, and my mastering as a whole, I you need to be I, a genius. I do some, some gentle compression. I use UAD plugins for the kind of mastering chain, gentle compression, and there's some EQ correction. I also use some Sonable plugins and they're like, they tell me how loud it is. They tell me the spectral balance, you know, whether it's, it fits in with other, it shows you a curve basically of other songs within that genre and how the EQ looks. And then it compares it to my EQ. And it will show me if my bass is way off or if it's way too loud or way too quiet. And then I can use, I use the um, fab filter limiter. And then I use that yeah. to, kind of like, to bring the level up to a loudness, which, which fits, you know, we yeah, have a, yeah. For the melodics lessons, we use a certain loudness, so I use that to check the loudness of the final track for the lesson. Um, can we move on to another question? Because we're going through time. Should we go to Mr. Sam's question? We have, he Which asked about one? doing diff he's doing different masters for different platforms, but um, I think we kind of covered that. They these kind of loudness plugins, the one I use, the the Sonable. I can't remember what it's called. But it's a sonable loudness one, and it'll give you profiles for different streaming services. So you can then create different masters to send to different services. But when I've been doing distribution, I, they just gave me to upload one master. So it's not like I'm able to upload different masters for different services. 
Very good question. I've never had to make different masters, to be honest. Uh, apart from like, I've made edits of different tracks. Right. So Sp Spotify will often have a radio edit where we sort of condense the track um, because obviously it's a stream stream platform. Uh, if you have a sort of shorter arrangement, it will have more replay value. And mm -hmm. then my Beatport release, which is obviously for DJs, will be like a long cut of the tune and it will have all the time needed for um, uh, beat matching and stuff like that. I've never had to change, yeah, like the quality of the master or the mix or anything like that. Okay. So we move on to Mr. Sam's other question about working with other artists. It was, what's the best way to give them constructive advice? You know, to, to <laughs> their problems, errors, mistakes. You work with a lot of other artists, right? A lot of your releases are with other yeah. artists and singers. So I think you're more in a position to answer that than me. Artists are, is that because you're a solitary producer? Yeah, I just do it on my own. Um, so I guess in the context he's saying giving another artist advice, say they've sent you a track for feedback, the first thing that I'll immediately do so that like no one's offended, and I actually love this, receiving this myself, is when I send a track out, for example, let's say I send you a tune, mm -hmm. I'll be like, Rupert, I've made this tune, and I just want a vibe check. And that is you listening to it, and it's like with all its flaws, but you're hearing just like the vibe and the potential. And you're going, yeah, this is sick, finish it. And I'll be like, cool. And then I'll worry about the stuff later. And then other times I say, I've passed the vibe check with all my mates and I'm like, cool, great. This is cool. And then I'll polish it off. Then I'll send it to someone and be like, right, I want you to please just rip this to shreds. So <laughs> when I get other people's music, I'll reply to them and say, are you looking for a vibe check? Or do you want me to actually try and pick this apart where I can? And that avoids, you know, people getting upset or anything because, you know, sometimes you work on something for eight hours and then someone immediately just replies with like, oh, the kick needs work. And maybe you are wanting to say, oh, it's so cool, you know. So that would be like one way of navigating that. Um, and personally, that's how I like to work as well. Um, but in like a collaborative setting, I guess, yeah, it's just it's just being really honest. And if someone comes up with something you're not feeling, you've got to say you're not feeling it because at the end of the day, it's going to cloud your creative judgment. And if, if you're not feeling what's happening in front of you, then you're not going to be as creatively valuable when it comes to your turn for like input or whatever. Say if you're taking turns in the studio or sending stems to each other. Right. Um, it's, it's but yeah, just... There's going to be a level of trust there, right? For... Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I've done sessions where like I've not felt the tune and, you know, you sort of get to the end and you're like all right, mate, I think you should just take this one <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's not for me and I don't want to put my name, not because it's bad, you know, but like, because you're not putting effort in because you don't feel it, yeah. you shouldn't be able to take the credit. So like, I'm always like, I'll just take a step back sort of thing and say, you know, you take, you take the credit. That's, that's the vibe. Okay, let's move on to Joe B1. He said, he's juggling a lot of responsibilities in life. And yes. he's finding it hard either to get into producing music, but like what tips do you have for staying in the creative grind? What like <laughs> what 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 keeps you going? What stops you from sitting down and playing PlayStation when you Bro, going? this is the secret sauce we're all looking for, I'm pretty sure, man. Like I I'm always fighting between making tunes and my PlayStation 5. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this question is is targeted. Yeah, I feel like I wrote it myself. Um, I guess it's not an immediate solution, but when when you're kind of in two minds, never force the studio because if you force it, then you might not have a great time and then you're going to kind of like want to push it away in future. So yeah. I always jump in the studio when literally all of my body is saying, I want to be creative and I want to do this. If I'm in two minds, I just generally won't bother. Um, another thing that you could kind of add into this is maybe he's is experiencing a form of, you know, writer's block, creative block that he's not quite recognized or addressed. And ways to get around that maybe if he's not feeling inspired and wants to fuel the creative grind, as it were, is to listen to wildly different music or that you normally listen to or go and experience wildly different things. Um mm -hmm. 
So for me, it sounds super cliche, but literally getting out of my house makes a massive difference. Like if I'm sat indoors all day and I'm feeling pretty stale, I don't think that's going to change. Like it just doesn't change. Whereas if, you know, I go out, I'll meet some friends, I'll go for a walk in the in the woods or I'll go see something like a movie. And I don't know if anyone's seen me piping up in the chat recently about June 2. But June 2 was like completely blown my mind in terms of like the sonics and how well everything works together. And this is, yeah, inspired me a crazy amount recently. So yeah, it could be as simple as watching a film, uh, but just try and get out of your your comfort zone in some way, whatever that is. That's my advice. What about yours? I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm at a different stage. I would say like, if you only have a small amount of time to try and focus on learning one thing or doing one thing, so, I mean, we all have this problem of buying too many plugins, buying too many <laughs> sam samples or sample packs or whatever. Yeah. So if you don't have like too much time, try and just give yourself half an hour just to learn that one synth that you've bought, right? So learn, make a few patches, store them as presets, um, go into the sample packs you found, find bits you like, create drum kits, create, you know, extract loops that you really like. Just like if you have the, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have the option just to favorite them in your DAW and, and keep them for later. So when you do find yourself with a bit more time, then you can like really get into it and you're not being held back by just making new patches. You already have the patches you made on the synth. You already have the samples you want to use. So just get in there and just like bang out a track as quickly as possible. That's really good advice. Um, I, yeah, I forgot about that myself where <laughs> you can just have literally sound design sessions where if you're not feeling creative enough to finish a whole track or even make a whole idea, you can just like bump a load of sounds and then they're good to go like for your next one. Mm -hmm. So we, sorry, I need to get some water, but should we move on to some track feedback? Um, yeah. Who are we going to start with? Um, we start with Mr. Sam's track. I'm just going to pull it up in my browser and hopefully this will be able to play on the... Yep. It worked before when we did it, so let's see. Okay. Go live. <clears throat> With the body video that pops up, you might have to unmute it if it just came out for you. And we're going to play it, and I'll be back in a second. I can hear it.
Sorry to cut that short, but we're gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna run through a bunch of tracks. So, do you want to go first, or should I go first? Oh, sure. I'll say a couple points. Um, immediately, I want to give a special nod to. I think it sounds like a a fun mixture between Oasis and Nine Inch Nails with the like industrialness uh, towards the latter half of the track. Um, one thing that I th thought could be quite interesting is. Obviously, I know it was quite industrial and like ominous sounding, but in the second half, maybe having like a melodic bass um, with some kind of like, yeah, melody behind it could be quite interesting. Um, but in terms of like the mix, like, yeah, the low end is, I'd say, quite, quite intense on that one. Excuse me. Sorry, I've been struggling with a cold. I'm still getting over <clears> it. But I think it's the bass kind of swamps the track when it comes in. It sounds like a kind of cassette kind of compression kind of thing where when the bass yeah. everything kind of ducks back and it's quite a cool effect. And I'm wondering whether that was intended or accidental. And there are in the kind of like scratchy industrial kind of sounds, there are some kind of yes harsh frequencies that could have been brought back. And I feel it could have been like more like spread out. So it could have been all around you and a bit more, I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. But I do I see everyone's comments and I do actually agree that it's a great great start of a TV show soundtrack. Mhm. Mm yeah, it's 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 a great kind of intro or contemplative contemplative moment in a TV show. Yeah, introspective vibes, man. Should we move on? Thank to... you, Mr. Sam. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sam. Let's have some clapping in the chat, Mr. Sam. Um, let's we move on to audio defect wave. And this yep. is we did have two, but I think we're only going to have time for one on this one. So we're going to go for Lux, and that's the twenty twenty three. I'm going to do the same sharing. There we go. We're live, and I'll play it. Sorry for the bad transition there, well, but we're going to have to <laughs> cut and give some feedback on this one. 
Um, I feel like there's some kind of rogue sounds in the bass there. They're kind of like in both my ears, kind of sub bassy sounds. I think from the ARP, I think from some delay, excuse me, delay effects. Um, yeah. And there's, there's a bass that comes in halfway through that kind of like lifts the emotion of the track. And I feel like it's kind of swamped out by the other bassy sounds that are in there. I think it comes around like one minute 57, about two minutes in. Yeah, I think with a bit of bit of gentle high passing on some of the other elements, that bass would really come out like really nicely and kind of just give a good push in the middle of the track. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I um, I'm I'm really into the ARP man. It reminds me of um, someone just to mention actually the Postal Service. Mm -hmm. uh, the song I think it's called the District. Uh, two seconds. What's it called? The District sleeps alone tonight. So yeah, it's proper uplifting, ethereal energy. I really like the like swelling pads that come in halfway through, the more like high end ones. Um Yeah, it's just yeah, really nice and again another introspective tune. I did really like the drums. So the drums really accentuate the ARP well because they're kind of like syncopated with each other. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like an upbeat you know, like 16th stabby energy. So that's really fun. I think they complement each other well. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I don't really have any comments in terms of like crit critical feedback, but I agree with you on the low end there. Yeah, it's really like the ARPs are really beautiful sounding. There's a really nice vibe to it. It's, as Mike said, it's kind of like Royxoppy vibes on those kind of plinky ARPs. Yeah. It's great. Um, okay. So we move on thank to... Thank you very much, Audio yes, Defect you. Wave. Claps in the chat for Audio Defect Wave. We're going to move on to Wasabi Pimp, I think. Wasabi Pimp Ninja. Let's <laughs> see if I can... This is a, an iconic name. Yeah, I'm just going to change the... Oh, sorry. Not what I was looking for. I need to share a different window. And there we go. That's it. Yeah, this one's a little bit quiet. I can't turn it up much more than it is already, unfortunately. Yeah, volume's all the way up on SoundCloud, unfortunately. Okay, let's pause that one. First thing, it's very quiet, but that's, that's, that's not a bad thing. It can be mastered. You use the limiter just to get the, the levels quite high. Um, SoundCloud will limit it, even if you go too high. So not limit it, I think it just brings the level down, doesn't it? So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So comments about the track itself. I love the ARPs again. I do love this kind of, I've always had ARPs in my tracks. It's just something I really love to, to play around with. You know, you just Close to a, home for you, man. You hold a chord and you just kind of get creative with the sounds and delays and 
the decays and stuff. It's some real like sci-fi soundtrack vibes. I feel like I'm going off into space. You know, it could be the the backing for like a space RPG or something like that. It's really Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice and um uh... It's kind of got that vibe where it doesn't need to be pinned down by like a drum kit or anything. Um, no, it's love. What, it, what could be really cool is maybe some like automation on like a filter, like a high pass or a low pass, so that you have some more movement. But this is like later on in the track, obviously, for some progression mm-hmm. vibes. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's kind of it is like a proper soundtrack thing. So it, we don't really need to fit, look at the structure too much. It's just kind of. It is what it is, man. It's a lovely experience. Um, some other things that I thought could be cool. Again, this will be later later down the line. So for progressive elements is um, stripping some elements back. So you could like maybe strip back some of the arps or again, some of the frequencies of the arps that like take all the low end out, take all the high end out, just little things mm. like that where you can build a sort of dynamic range so that you have like a almost like a call and response that your uh, audience can listen to. Mm-hmm. That's a really great tip. Yeah, I would, I was going to say just more subtle variations, as you said, automations, delays, reverbs, filters, that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's it's a really nice track. So thank you, thank you for Wasabi Pimp Ninja. Greatest name I've seen so far. We're going to move on to Joe B1. It's called Chasing Shadows. I'm just going to check the volumes and everything, and then I'm going to share. nice and short um i love this one there's some great like gating lfo effects going on and they're changing all the time and it keeps the track interested um it's mixed really great this is this is the the user was saying that they don't find so much time to make music because of kids and wanting to play playstation i think they should find a bit more time make a few more tracks that's it's, it's going brilliantly yeah yeah, a hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. The first, uh, I don't know if it's like a piano or like a Rhodes or a synth, but it's very Boards of Canada esque, which I really enjoyed. Mm. And um, uh, we've got a good use of like uh, dr- um, effects on the drums here for like transitionary moments. Mm-hmm. Um, and generally speaking, yeah, like you said, the the gating or the LFO stuff is really great progression, and it's like ear candy, keeps everyone interested. And yeah, the song the song is over before you want it to be. So yeah, make some more, please. Mm-hmm. Right, let's claps for Joby One. 
going to move on to the Sago music. I'm just going <clears> to <throat> grab the link. Not this. One sec. very bad cutting that one off but we are pushed for time that's that's fantastic i love that one um yeah lots of nice change-ups there's some really great sounds the mixing is really good um i would the, the small small thing i would say is just there's the, there's no the transitions between different sections are a bit sudden there could be some kind of like lead up to them some kind of effects some kind of automation but it's a really small thing Tom, yeah, I'm 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 quite into this, um, especially with what I'm making at the moment. This is pretty like reminiscent of what I like with big atmospheric intros. It's got a nice warm lead. Um, just yeah, the intro progressions are super. It gets you hooked in. It's really good. Mm -hmm. I love all the little like echoey elements, like that synth that's like do -lo 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 -lo. really into that. Um, and I don't know if this is a, yeah, so my only comment, because I I'm really like this tune, is if this is a personal decision, then fair enough. But I would say just a more present kick in the mix, bring it forwards, because, you know, this sounds like an almost chill-steppy, dub-steppy, EDM-y vibe, so it should have a more bus bussing kick man and i think that would really take the song to the next level however if it's you're trying to keep it more like um ambient then yeah it's it's your decision so it's a really great track really into it yeah claps for saga music i hope i'm saying that right okay we are gonna run over but um Let's go to Yaksoy with Pinky Promise. I'm going to pull that up on the stream. There it is. The volume. Yeah, let's go.
Sorry, absolutely terrible DJ transitions here. Um, I need a, vo <laughs> a volume slider to bring down. Um, I love this. Um, there's some really cool, like, 90s rave slash Nintendo yeah. RPG strings going time. on there. Um, yeah, I love it. The thing I would say is there's a couple of bases going on. They're kind of clashing with each other. You need to find mm -hmm. spaces in the, the sub base region to kind of like scoop them out, find their own space, use some side chaining maybe. But yeah, it's it sounds like a like you know my youth, but also rave music of today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I happily echo what you're saying. I feel like the melody is like really funky and in, in, like instantly grabs you straight away. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the pads that come in. Um, the bass that rides under the melody is really nice as well. I feel like it's very funky and exciting. And I feel like the song has a lot of events in it, you know, kind of like quick transitions into different things being there or not there. So that keeps it actually very engaging for me as a listener. Um, and that effect towards the end there, just as it broke down, really, really came out of nowhere. And I was intrigued as to what was going to happen next. So yeah, good use of effects uh, for transitions as well. I did see your face. You came in, you looked surprised. I was like, no, just like, doo, doo, doo. yeah, yeah, it caught me by surprise. And that's, that's the beauty of it, man. Yeah. So round of applause for Yaksoi. Some claps in chat. Okay. I am aware that we're running over. Um, let's start a little bit late. So let's get one more in. And For sure. I think if people didn't get their tracks heard and they still want to have them heard, if they can keep posting them in the events page, and then maybe we can find time to come back and do a bit more feedback and listen through. 100%. Okay. So let's go. Let's go on to Indie Rock Girl. And it's called Tropical Sundays. There we go, let's come up. Okay, right. So that one was also a little bit quiet. Um, they said that they created with summer in mind, all the fun, the planes in the sun, or feeling the sun rays wash over you to lay in the sand. Definitely a, a sunny kind of vibe. Feel it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice leads, nice, nice sounds. The drums sound good. Mm, I would say that it sounds a little bit dry. As before, I said, like, you can apply too much reverb to sounds but also you kind of like too too little so everything sounds a bit dry and it's nice to use a bit of reverb just to kind of like meld elements together put them in the same space especially drum sounds you know <clears throat> we're used to drums recorded in the same room so they have a, a room sound right so if you have your hi-hats and your snares and your toms or whatever a little bit of the same reverb on them all, they'll sound like they're in the same space. They're not going to sound so disconnected. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, from a musical standpoint, I thought it was really good. The melodies, 
uh, you know, because there's a few layers of melodies going on, dance around each other really well. Um, and I think this is the first song that I've heard today with like a, a shaker in it, a tambourine. So I thought that was a fun, fun little switch up. Um, yeah, just good use of other percussion. So yeah, thumbs up from me. Okay, claps for Indie Rock Girl. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to listen to your track today, kind of running over time here. But as I said, keep posting your tracks in the event tracks channel. Maybe I'll give it a more catchy name so we can come back to that. We are going to do a boot camp stream on here with, um, what's his name? Tetro, that's his name. So Tetro is going to be in the community <laughs> and he's going to be giving feedback on the bootcamp tracks. Um, but we will, we will try and fit in another feedback session. If people want to keep sharing their tracks, sharing their progress, if they have questions about making music, we don't have to do the whole question and answer because we've done that already. So we can just dive straight into giving some feedback. So thank you, Dom, for being here. Um, clap for you. Thank you for everyone thank who's you. tuned in. Um, thank you yeah, for sending your music and asking your questions and being part of the community. And we look forward to seeing you at the next community event.